Thank you, Emily. That was really inspiring. I was asked to speak to you this morning about catalytic philanthropy. And I said to myself, what is it? I've never heard of it before. This click is not working, guys. Do I have to point it in some direction? or Can you drive it for me? I'll talk without the, without the slides in the meantime. <clears throat> when we were looking up the definition of catalytic, uh, we found in Wikipedia that... <laughs> southern hemisphere <laughs> the water goes down the plug hole in the other direction so, so um, Wikipedia talked about catalytic being basically a chemical reaction that, that helps a process and you can either have positive or you can have negative and the negative type of catalysts are actually called inhibitors we um, in terms of our thoughtful giving um, Try to relate that to the things that we do. And a new approach to, um, to catalysts of social change. And the way we think about it is taking responsibility for achieving results, mobilising a campaign for change, using all available tools, corporate investment, capital advocacy, litigation and, and lobbying to create actionable knowledge. Now we've used for some time now, uh, in, in our foundation, a thing called the Tracy Gary Philanthropic Continuum. And as you'll see, that starts with pure charity on the left. Um, when Margaret and I started the foundation back in 94, we very much worked at that level. Just pure charity, helping people in need. You'll see that the next part of the continuum is systems for service or systems of service, networks, etc. And we work in that area as well. I'll show you some, some graphs in a minute. And then we get into empowerment and, and capacity building. Uh, and then at the far end of the continuum uh, is really what catalytic is all about. And that's some of the stuff that you just heard from Emily. And that really makes uh, a real change to systems. So if we move on to where we get the actual numbers of Tyndall Foundation uh, approvals. You'll see that on the, on the left, it's by far, at the moment, in, um, in the charity sector. Systems and services next, empowerment next, social change, and catalytic at the end. But when you look at how we actually spend that money, you'll see that's very, very different. Uh, and by far the, the, the largest one is in social change uh, and systems and service. Catalytic is still, or venture philanthropy, is still a small part of what we do. But we've started moving into that in the last couple of years uh, in a similar way to, to that of the Tao Foundation. I wanted to give you a, a couple of examples of where we actually practice this type of philanthropy. But before I do, I was really taken by Emily's discussion about changing the, social, the, the juvenile justice system. And I wanted to t tell you about the difference between her experience and ours. And this is quite controversial, but I think it really does demonstrate New Zealand as it was maybe a year ago, two years ago, and how that is, I believe, emerging and starting to change. We went and supported a group uh, that set up an, an organisation in, in um, Hamilton called Tahuri Hunga. And it ran for 18 months and we were able to prove that re-offending of those people that were in that facility dropped from the regular 82% down to 12%. We went to the government and said, look, this is working and we need some help. We said, we'll put in half the money, which was $700,000, if you'll put in the other half. Sadly, not only did they say no, but they shut it down and decided to do things a different way. Now, this is not a criticism of the government. It's just, I think, a lack of understanding. 
Uh, this week, while I've been in Wellington, I, I, was, I had a, an interesting meeting with the police, who are actually making some big changes and have been invited to be part of a group that will look at justice in a preventative way rather than a reactionary way. So I think we are moving along into the continuum of venture, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we don't let these sort of things happen because, as you've heard from Emily, treating people with unconditional respect does actually work. And it saves a huge amount of money because I think it's something like $90,000 a year for incarceration in our prison system. So on to some of the others that we've been involved in. The first one is community foundations. And it was probably about 12 years ago we put up a challenge fund for $2 million dollars to try and help community foundations get going in New Zealand. I'm very pleased to say there are around about 13 of them now, and between them, they've raised $150 million. Now, a lot of that money is actually promised as opposed to in the bank right now. The most successful is the Acorn Foundation in, in Tauron, and they have over $100, uh, over $100 million promised there. Uh, the idea of it is that people give, it goes into a fund, and then 5% of that fund is given to the charities of their choice forever. And so if the fund's big enough, their fund is big enough, um, a lot of money goes to those funds every year from there on. And of course, their children and grandchildren get to, to benefit in that. The next... Uh, that I'd like to talk about is the Grow Our Own Workforce. Uh, don't be alarmed, that's not a real person in the building. <laughs> if it was, I'd say he was dead. <laughs> Back uh, soon after John Key was elected, he had a job summit, you might remember, and I was invited to go along with one of our trustees to chair one of the sessions. Uh, we discovered during that conversation that the South Auckland uh, DHB, or Counties Manukau DHB, had 7,000 workers and a churn of about 700 per year. So 700 new jobs every year. Most of those prior to that were being filled by new immigrants, the Philippines and India. And yet, there was this massive human resource in South Auckland that we're not getting into employment in the health sector. And so we decided we'd take that on as a project. We've so far invested two and a half million in it, and we see it as one of our catalytic long-term projects. We now have uh, 470 odd kids in the pipeline. Around 95% of those are Pacific Island or Maori. And what happens is that um, our coordinators go into three academy schools, talk to the kids, take them along to the hospital to see things like the picture in front of you, and then talk to the parents about how they can move those students into $70,000 a year jobs. And lo and behold, there's been a change, a cultural change in a lot of these families where instead of their kids being told they've got to get out and start earning at 16, they're prepared to change their courses from arts to science and maths and to take the journey for a guaranteed health job in that particular sector. And so we're starting to see some, some remarkable changes and some fantastic results. Uh, we've, we've already seen quite a, a large number of Maori midwives uh, come through the system. Uh, there are a number of scholarships. So you know, we're quite excited about what's actually happening in this particular sector. And here's just a great example of one of these midwives helping a mother uh, in a Maori family. The next one I want to talk to you about is the Working Together More Fund. Part of our challenge funding in this area is to try to encourage groups who work in similar fields and similar geographies to actually work together. It's a seed fund type of arrangement, but what it does is it actually gets them to think about how they can collaborate. Emily's discussion and mine around Tahiri Hunger is all about, I believe, us in the philanthropy sector collaborating with both government and communities. We can't do it alone. The government can't do it alone. It's about joining ourselves up and trying to solve problems 
that, it, that actually exist in this country. So they're working together more fund. Uh, there's just some of the people that we now have uh, in another one that we'd like to, uh, to talk about now, and that is the, the youth connections across Auckland. And a lot of what we believe the Tyndall Foundation can solve issues is to actually get youth into employment. As you know, we have large youth unemployment throughout the country, but in particular in Auckland, and particularly in South Auckland. So we, we were instrumental in helping get this program up and running. We fund three of the local boards, and there's now seven local boards funded. And the idea, again, is collaboration between people that live in their local geographies uh, and employers. And it's all about, similar to the Grow Our Own Workforce, it's finding the demand from the employer, and then it's putting the student in the right pipeline to get the right education or the right apprenticeship to end up with that job. We've been inspired by Otrahonga and Mayor Dale, Dale Williams, who managed to basically have zero unemployment amongst youth in his town, and he's been a, a great advocate for the scheme and has helped us a lot. Uh, on the back of the Mayors for Jobs Task Force, which our foundation has funded now for many, many years. So what have we learned? We've learned we need to remain flexible while still sticking to the international roadmap. We need to be engaged as a funder, but we, did, but we don't need to be a friend. We need to more be um, a funder to those organisations. Uh, use steering groups and advisory uh, panels. Uh, I might like to just add for any of you that are already in philanthropy that this works a treat. Uh, we invite a round table discussion of interested parties who we believe are the right people to get something moving. And as a result, we've seen a lot of great successes and new initiatives that spin out of these discussions. Uh, we look for a, a, an appetite for change within communities. And we, need, we believe we need to have a warm heart, a cool head, and a hard nose, and a lot of patience to make this work. I, I'd just like to add in closing, because I've had to cut this short because of the, uh, the, the time that we had available, that working together, I think, as a country, in a similar way that we heard from Emily, is very much the, the catalyst for that. <coughs> we can't do it alone. We need to work. Um, collaboratively, and I'm sure if we do that, we'll see some some really major changes. Um, our foundation has been very proud to, to get uh, Tim Broadhead here to this conference, and I had some really great discussions with Tim yesterday. And I'm sure those of you that can get along to his talk will learn an awful lot about what's been happening in Canada over the last two years. Thanks for listening.